Hi, my name is Ewin, and I was born in Thailand. In Nepal. In northeastern of China. I was born and raised in Los Angeles, California, in a suburb called Palos Verdes. I'm the daughter of Chinese immigrants who fled China in 1949 during the Communist Revolution. I was born in Toronto, Canada, and consider myself an Asian North American. Hi, everyone. My name is Tree, or Tri, if you're a Vietnamese-speaking person, and I was born in Vietnam. I'm going to be your guest host in this special series. Over the years, Green Card Voices has had the honor of amplifying the voices of many Asian immigrants as they share their stories of coming to America. We are tremendously thankful for their outstanding contributions and long-standing friendship. We stand with you today and every day. Lily Tung Crystal is the artistic director of Theater Moo in the Twin Cities. She is also an actor, director, mother, and a baseball fan. Lily most recently directed Moo's production of Jihei Park's Peerless. She moved to the Twin Cities from the San Francisco Bay Area, where she directed David Henry Huang's Chinglish and his revival of Flower Drum Song at Palo Alto Players and the world premiere of Leia Nanako Winkler's Two Mile Hollow at Ferocious Lotus. She was named a Theater Bay Area Award finalist for outstanding direction for all three productions. As a performer, Lily has worked with theaters across the country, including Berkeley's Reps Ground Floor, Cal Shakes, Crowded Fire, Magic Theater, New World Stages, Portland Center Stage, SF Playhouse, and Syracuse Stage. Lily is a 2016 YBCA 100 honoree named by Yerba Buena Center for the Arts as a creative pioneer making the provocations that will shape the future of culture. Rick Shiomi has been a playwright director and artistic director in the Asian American theater movement since the 1980s. He has received the McKnight Distinguished Artist Award, the Ivy Award for Lifetime Achievement, and the Sally Ordway Irvine Award for Vision. He was the co-founder of Theater Moo and the artistic director for 20 years. His plays include Mask, Dance, Rosie's Cafe, and Yellow Fever, which played off-Broadway around North America and in Japan. His directing includes productions of Flower Drum Song, David Henry Huang's version, Into the Woods, The New Mikado, and Caught by Chris Chen. He's a co-founder and a co-artistic director of Full Circle Theater Company. His hobbies include playing golf and Scrabble. Welcome back to another episode of the Hashtag Love Your A- Asian Neighbors podcast series with Green Card Voices. My name is Tree. I'm you, I've been the guest host for the series. And today we have two special guests, two theater artists based here in uh, the Twin Cities, Minnesota. You'll get to hear from them soon, Lily and Rick. Reintroducing what this, ep- uh, this podcast is about. Based loosely on our story stitch game, the Green Card Voices story stitch game, where we ask questions that are more personable, that allow for people to name more sensitive, complex parts of their lives, both micro level and a macro level, which include um, introducing yourself, what your names, your name is, what your pref- uh, preferred gender pronouns are, where do you consider home, whether that's geographically, spiritually, artistically, and so forth. What languages do you speak? Aspire to speak and share something that you value about yourself. My name is uh, Rick Shiomi, and um, my preferred uh, gender pronouns are he, his, and him. Um, And I consider North America my home because I was born and raised in Canada, but I've spent much of my adult life in the United States. And so I have this sort of... um, feeling that both places are uh, very uh, powerful uh, senses of home for me. Um, And artistically, um, my home has been in Asian American theater for the for the past 35, 40 years or so. Um, And and in that sense, uh, I found this hugely rich uh, world for myself um, uh, that I continue uh, even though now I am the co-artistic director of Full Circle Theater and I am um, uh, working in a context that uh, looks at more diversity across multiple uh, groups, not just Asian Americans. So that's been a whole new experience for me. Um, but still, theater is, uh, is my home in that sense. Um, in terms of language, um, I am pretty much strictly an English speaker. Uh, I can say a few words of Japanese, um, but don't understand it in any real conversational way. And I understand a few words of French because I am from Canada. And uh, sometimes I mix up my French and my Japanese because when I'm looking for another language, 
uh, they seem to be housed in the same part of my brain. Um, and finally, uh, something that I value about myself, uh, really, um, I value uh, my optimism, my sense of, of things uh, will work out. And, um, and in many cases, um, they have. And so in some ways that has reinforced uh, that sense of uh, optimism that if you keep working on something, um, you'll find a way to uh, uh, develop the, the idea that you started with. Hi, everybody. My name is Lily Tung Crystal, and my gender pronouns are she, her, hers. When people ask me what I consider home, I think of it in a spiritual, geographical, artistic way, in a really whole, whole centered approach to where I, what I call home. And I would say that I consider a few cities my home because I have spent different parts of my life in these cities. And those cities are Los Angeles, where I was born and raised, and then New York, where I went to school, New York State. I went to school there, and I also lived in New York City for a little bit of time, but I, I lived in Ithaca, New York for four years, going to school. And then I lived in New York City for a little while. So I, I feel like I really found myself and who I was as a person in New York. And then after I lived in New York, I lived in Shanghai, China for many years as an adult, working there as a journalist and a singer. And I felt that was a really life-changing experience. And so I consider Shanghai one of my homes. And then I moved to San Francisco where I was there. I was there for 20 years before I moved to the Twin Cities. So I had my, I got married there and had my son there. So that is, and, and he created my, created my life as a, a theater artist there. So that in, in very many ways is a spiritual, personal, artistic home, San Francisco. And finally, I've been in the Twin Cities for eight months now. And so I am, um, I'm slowly but surely making this place my home uh, in, in very many ways, spiritually and artistically um, and personally. I speak English and Mandarin Chinese. And something I value about myself, I value that I'm a good listener and I value that I love people and I love their stories. And so I think that has helped me, both those things have helped me become an empathetic person and really be a lover of stories because what I do, whether it's as an actor, as a director, as a theater maker, or leader as a, I also worked as a writer and a television producer for many years. And although the through line of all those things is that it's storytelling. And so I feel like those values of really loving people and their stories and being a good listener helps me be a better storyteller. Thank you both so much. I'm really glad to have you both on today. And so- Thanks, Trey. Absolutely. Um, with both your backgrounds and your enthusiasms and energies, we want to ask you both these five questions. Uh, the first of which is part of our bonus extended uh, COVID questions in our Story Stitch game. Describe the many ways your personal life, which can include but does not center your work life, has changed in recent weeks. Um, Rick, since you went uh, first introducing yourself, Billy, would you like to take a shot at this? Gosh, um, how has my life not changed in the last few weeks? I would say personally, it's changed in that I am spending so much more time with my husband and my son. And, and that's a gift. And it's also can be challenging. <laughs> um, as most parents know, homeschooling a 10 year old can be, uh, ha has its own set of challenges and, and learnings. And, you know, my husband is a touring musician. He tours usually with Boss Gags. He's a saxophonist, pianist, and guitar player. And he's often out of town or away from us for six months of the year. So, um, but because of the COVID lockdown, his work has been canceled for the summer and most likely the rest of the year. And so, We've been spending, my son and I, my son Cole and I have been spending a lot more time with Eric, my husband, this year because he's home and, and it's wonderful and it's, and it's, uh, you know, it's something to get used to, to 
how, you know, we've been, we for many, many years, over a decade, we've been used to daddy being gone for, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of those months. And, and it's been like the first opportunity, I think, that we have a situation where we're, you know, a family 24 seven, like all, you know, hundred percent of the time. And so that's been a change and a welcome one. Um, I think, you know, personally, it's been, this time has been challenging for me personally and spiritually because I'm an extrovert and I get a lot of my energy from, from other people and that, and I haven't been able to get that. And Zoom is great in, in connecting with old friends and being able to still do my work and connect with artists through Zoom. And I think it's, it's very, it's it, instead of being energizing as being in the room with other people is, I, it, it's challenging being on Zoom for many hours because the computer I think sucks energy when, when being in, the, in a room with people returns energy. So that's a challenge for me personally. I've also had some challenges spiritually because I, I'm starting to forget what, what real life was like, quote unquote, what real, quote unquote real life was like in terms of being with other people, um, gathering in spaces. You know, my life is a, I'm a theater artist and theater has to be done with other people. That's the central tenet of it. And so um, it's been, because I haven't been in that environment for a long time, it's been, I'm starting to forget what it was like to be in real life. And that has caused a weird existential crisis in that because I can't remember what real life was like, I'm starting to think this is real life. And so I don't have that beacon of, or that vision of hope on, on what life can become again. So that that's been affecting me personally. I think in terms of, you know, the personal effect, the, the effect of my, on my personal life of the work, you know, we at Theater Moo have made a, quick and large pivot to doing work online. So we do three events online every week. We um, do online readings and move Mondays. We have an online live hangout with some of the nation's leading Asian American theater artists called Mutini Hour. And we also do a family explorations um, thing on Saturday mornings where families can learn an activity from one of our artists. So we're doing the work, but it's it's all virtual now. And, and I thought, I think we all thought we'd be less busy during this time, but we're actually more busy because we're, we're, we're pivoting to a new platform and it's been really rich and, um, and it's been really rewarding because we feel like we can connect with people and our audiences and our supporters and fans and the Asian American community at large through this work. And it, I personally, some of the challenges are again that it's because it's virtual. Um, we're not getting the same, you know, in person, um, in person feedback or energy and um, connection that we would have gotten in, an, in in otherwise normal circumstances. Thank you for sharing, Lily and uh, Rick. Do you have a response to this question? I think one of the major changes has been. Um, the focus around food, um, the acquiring of food and the uh, preparation of food and the eating of food. It's kind of interesting how um, now uh, the whole idea of not going to grocery stores is like in using um, a delivery service and then having to clean the food be before you uh, actually use it. All of those things are like to me, really like huge changes in patterns where food used to be something you, you took for granted. You you kind of grabbed a quick sandwich or you or you were running into a subway or something like that to grab lunch. But in fact, now you're doing all three meals at home. And so suddenly that whole um, uh, acquiring preparation uh, uh, and, and consumption of food is is completely in a different sort of context. Um, so that's one of the big things. Um, another thing is, uh, uh, as, as, um, Lily was saying, um, you think that there's going to be a lot less work if you're at home, but in, in the lives we lead now on online, um, there's actually quite a bit of work, quite a bit of administrative work, organizational work, um, 
I've learned all of this uh, uh, information about Zooming and have done so many Zooming meetings. So all of these things are like um, uh, completely changing the routine of my life in that sense. Um, I've had more time, uh, on the other hand, I've had more time because I'm spending so much time at home, we're playing a lot more Scrabble. <laughs> and so my wife and I um, have time during the day or in the evening to uh, uh, continue our games of Scrabble. And, and fortunately, uh, I always describe us as kind of a 50-50 relationship. And so um, she wins half the time and I win half the time. So it makes it, in that sense, fun and competitive, not one-sided or anything like that. Um, so those things, um, have really, uh, uh, changed in a sense, uh, for myself. Um, and I'm really in that sense, uh, uh, living a way more order. It's what's interesting is it's a way more orderly life because the routine of life is way clearer than it is when you're running around town, going to meetings, grabbing lunch somewhere, uh, uh, going to rehearsals at night, all those things that were all like, kind of like you're on the run all the time. Suddenly it's like a steady walk and you're, can, you're always walking, but you're, you're always moving, but, but it's way steadier. It's way more uh, measured in a way. So it's really been interesting in that sense. I like the variety of uh, perspectives and things that you are both observing in your life. It's a, speaks to how differently COVID is affecting folks. And I like, uh, very valuable to, to know. And so we move on to our next question, which is um, one of our two guest specific questions where dep uh, depending on the background of our guests, we shape the questions to, to their backgrounds. And so our first one it asks, how has the COVID-19 pandemic impacted your artistic communities and or your practice? And so uh, Rick, would you like to go first this time? Uh, okay, um, so of course the the pandemic has had a huge impact on our company, um, and it's been sort of a whole series of chain reactions. Uh, the first is that uh, we had to uh, uh, postpone our production of a play um, called uh, Atacama, which is written by Augusto Amador, and uh, we were going to produce it at Mixed Blood Theater in May of this year, and so it was going to open um, uh, this past weekend. Um, and what happened is like sometime in the middle of March, um, we decided that uh, this whole pandemic, which was just at that point, starting to really uh, become a major uh, issue um, in the communities uh, around the United States, around the world, but <clears throat> definitely um, also in the Twin Cities. And so we realized that we had better uh, postpone the production. So that was a huge change right there because we do mainly one primary main stage production a year. So in, a, in the idea of postponing that is a huge deal, but we did that. And we were actually very fortunate because as we know now, um, people are not gonna be doing theater probably for six months, maybe a year, maybe longer. Um, as we knew it, in a sense. And so that was something that uh, was a huge impact. But then uh, um, came the, the whole chain reaction. We then decided, well, what we'll do is we'll push back that production of Atacama to the next season, the 20, 2021 season. And we happened to have a slot, uh, uh, a three-week slot at the Dowling studio of the Guthrie Theater. So we said, oh, that's fine. We will move our production back to that point. And we're hoping that by, by that point, by March of next year, we will have figured out somehow to be able to do theater again yeah, within this community. Um, but of course, then the next day we find out that the, the Guthrie decided that they were not going to produce theater in the Dowling studio for the whole next season, the whole 2021 season. So our March 2021 um, uh, uh, slot was gone. And so then we had to think, what were we gonna do then? Um, at the same time, uh, we had a collaboration with Park Square Theater that was in the works uh, for the June, sort of May, June, 2021. And so uh, that actual agreement um, 
came to have a signing. So we decided to commit to that. And uh, we have an agreement to co-produce my new play, uh, uh, Fire in the New World, uh, at Park Square Theater next year. So then that happened. So then the Atacama production, we are now thinking of moving it back to the 2021-22 season and thinking that we might be able to um, uh, find a, a, a good venue for that play. So, um, so as you can see, all these things are, were sort of changing all in the last two or three weeks, making all these decisions. Um, and then, of course, um, we still have our, uh, our project called The Empathy Project, uh, which is being created by Stephanie Lee Walseth, who is one of our core artists at Full Circle Theater. And uh, we're hoping to do a reading of it this fall. Um, so that's going to be uncertain. It may end up as a Zoom reading because people still won't be able to gather. But now we're seeing more and more uh, people doing performances and readings and, and things like that on Zoom or on various versions of, of online um, uh, activities. So we're all... You know, so we're still thinking about that and and planning for that. Um, so all of these things have all kind of um, come up and down. Um, one of the one of the uh, uh, major pieces of good news for us was, in fact, that we uh, found out that the McKnight Foundation was going to support us for another uh, two year cycle of of uh, funding because the McKnight Foundation itself. Um, has understood that they want to support the artists that they have been supporting in the past. So in some ways we've gone up and down and up and down and, and finally we feel like we're in a reasonably uh, good place, partly because uh, Full Circle is still a small company with low overhead. Uh, we don't have our own building or, or things like that. We have a very small staff. so. Uh, in many ways, we are able to um, uh, survive this first cycle of, of change that's happened. But as you can see, um, it has definitely scrambled our plans, and we've had to sort of reorganize ourselves uh, in order to uh, uh, make sure we will be able to survive this next year or so. The COVID-19 pandemic has impacted our artistic communities and our practice to a great deal, as Rick was saying. I think in general, if we look at the art artist community across the country and probably the world, there's a lot of grief going on in what we've lost. Theater is shut down. And for many of us who do theater, it's our life, it's our passion, and it, it's what makes us who we are. And so there is, I think a lot of artists are going through a grieving process and not being able to do the thing that, that they were put on this earth to do. Um, to add stress to that spiritual grief is the fact that so many artists have lost their employment and their means of um, be, be, their, their means of being financially sound. So there's a lot of stress in how they're going to continue to pay the bills and eat and pay their rent. Um, so I think there's not only a spiritual crisis, but also a financial crisis for many artists in the theater who can no longer do their art because we, we simply cannot gather anymore. Um, if we at Theater Moo are trying to support our artists in any way we can. That's why we're continuing to do work virtually so that we can employ artists. Artists are also, we're also employing artists in, in building curriculum for two um, in-school programs, Moo Explorations and Moo Stories. And so that we, so that artists can have some work in creating curriculum, even though we can't be in the schools right now physically. We had to cancel, a few, you know, in many ways, Theater Moo was lucky because we weren't in the middle of a produ production when the lockdown started. And so we didn't have to cancel something we had already put time, money, and energy into. Um, or, you know, we didn't have to cancel something that we were already in rehearsal for or in production for. So we got lucky that way. So financially, Theater Moo was doing fine. We're able to pay our staff and artists for now. Um, but we are 
suffering the loss of having to cancel a few projects such as our school play, a play that was going into schools and other organizations, um, a play called Inside Out and Back Again by Min Kong, who's a Bay Area, a wonderful Bay Area um, playwright and composer. And the play was about a Vietnamese refugee family's experience coming to America. So we thought that would be a great play to bring to the Twin Cities, which has a large South Asian, Southeast Asian refugee population. And we also had to cancel our new ice festival, which is Rick knows Rick is the co-founder of theater Moo. And that has been, you know, going on since the beginning, it's a new works festival. We had to cancel that. And finally the big production, we as our big summer production, we were doing the co-production of Cambodian rock band by Lauren Yee, which is the show in the nation. That's it's, it's the show that's taking the nation by storm. It's a wonderful play slash musical. And we were doing that in co-production with Jungle Theater and we had to cancel that. We were actually supposed to go into rehearsals at the end of May and it was going to run through August. And, um, you know, besides the, the, besides the sadness that we can't present this wonderful work, it also meant, you know, letting go the artists that were part of that that part of that show, we were able to pay them something for their, for, um, for the contract, but, you know, nonetheless, they, they still lost, you know, work through the summer. So, so now we're, you know, how, I guess how it's affected. So I, I would say in a nutshell, it's affected the very, you know, this ex affected the very foundation, the COVID pandemic has affected the very foundation of the work that we do and the artists that we work with do and and how it's affected how it's affecting us now is that like i said we've been pivoting to doing online programming and doing three three events each week and for asian american asian pacific for asian pacific american heritage month we are um doing two uh we're doing two shows this month online. One is a variety show where that's being produced by Samukta Vangse. And um, we're having spoken word artists, com comedians and music musicians come on and um, show their work. And then at the end of the month, we're doing a 24 hour virtual play fest um, that's going to, and we're going to be um, featuring about 30 playwrights, directors, and actors in that. We've been, we've had to stop doing work with each other in person and pivot to the online space. But I, I also want to add, like, it, you know, the, there is a silver lining to that in that because we, we can do work in the online space, we've been able to reach a whole new audience internationally. So, uh, you know, theater by nature is a local activity and the audiences are local. And being that we're now doing these programs online, we have, you know, we have an audience of people from New York, from LA, from Philippines, from China. Um, you know, two weeks ago, we had George Takei on with Leah, Sol Leah Salonga and Jay Kuo. And, George, you, of course, you know, Leia is a Tony winning actor, singer, and Jay Quo wrote um, a musical Allegiance that they're both in. And for that one, for that one event, we had 110,000 views, which I was joking is more than like, more than the people, more than the number of people that will see Moo's work in like five or 10 years. I mean, I, I didn't even know the numbers, but because, because it's, so, you, you can reach so many more people online. So the silver lining is more people are, are, we're connecting with more people around the world, we're, more people around the world know us, and, and that's, been, that's been really um, heartening that we're able to make an impact, connect the Asian American community around the world um, through Theater Moo in this online space. I'm so glad for um, the health, the, the sort of forced health of your companies right now um, in, the, in the midst of all that. It's really tough, but I'm glad you both are 
finding new inroads. Hi, it's Tree, back from attending all the grad parties of the entire class of 2020. Congratulations, seniors, on all of your achievements. In addition to attending every grad party for this year's accomplished seniors, I also wrapped up our fourth Patreon Stitch Picks, the exclusive extended guest recordings available only for our podcast Patreon subscribers. With the podcast guests you've heard from tonight, hear from Lily, unbundling her family's harrowing story of becoming fugitives around the late 40s during the communist revolution. Leaving and losing many members of their immediate kin behind, Lily's parents and relatives fled from lethal persecution as they landed in Taiwan and eventually the U.S. During her own lifetime, Lily shares how she summoned her voice in the face of public backlash and absent support while active in the San Francisco Bay Area theater arts scene. She and her theater company protested the production of The Mikado, a play that historically employed yellowface in its casting and played racial jokes for laughs at the expense of Asian peoples. Through the initiative of Lily, her colleague, and from support of the Yerba Buena Center for the Arts, The Mikado was rewritten into a vastly more equitable production that is widely produced today. Rick himself has been a theater artist who found his footing in the 80s, though only after years of gradually turning away from a posture of assimilating into whiteness and towards learning about the struggles of Japanese peoples fighting for belonging in the U.S., having found out his own family had been interned during World War II, from raising up an arts festival in Vancouver with his friend Gordon, who became the inspiration for the character in his first big hit play, Yellow Fever, which itself was made possible due substantially to the supportive prompting from his new friend and famed playwright, David Henry Huang. Undoubtedly, Rick has lived a full life as an accomplished playwright on his own merits. He even has his own Mikado story to share. Around 2012, after the infamous libretto had become public domain and was no longer protected against adaptation, Rick was extended the chance to remake the Mikado in his own contemporary and subversive vision of the play. All that and more in our fourth edition of the Patreon Stitch Pick series. Head on over to Patreon and take a listen. And tell us in the comments how the themes that Lily and Rick share with us take shape in your life. Use the web link bit.ly forward slash for our GCV neighbors. That's B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash for our GCV neighbors to get started. We're going to move on to our one of our story stitch questions that's available in the story stitch deck that people can purchase on the green card voices website or <coughs> have access to on our Patreon page. Um, it's from our vulnerable section. It's the 10th question, in our vulnerable section. And it is tell a story of a time when family or friends didn't understand you. This doesn't have to be related to the pandemic or anything recent. It would be a good question for people who are both Asian and artists double whammy. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> right. In my family is a kind of classic uh, Asian American or Asian Canadian, um, uh, be successful um, family in a sense. So even though they came from working class uh, roots, um, there was always an emphasis on education and, and doing well in terms of um, just becoming um, uh, somebody with a reliable job. It didn't have to be, uh, uh, you didn't have to be rich, but you just wanted to be a respectable uh, person in society. That seemed to be a very important thing in our family. And I think it is important in many Asian families, uh, many immigrant families where the focus is on education and getting a good job, whether it's a doctor, dentist, teacher, uh, lawyer, whatever. Um, and actually, Philip Cotana has a wonderful song, um, uh, Asian American dream, I think. Um, that's, that's very funny, but <clears throat> a very funny commentary on that. Um, and so uh, in my family, uh, basically my uh, personal interest was not to do that. Uh, my personal interest was to find something else, some kind of alternative to that kind of uh, life. And um, uh, for a long time, and I may still think that I'm I may still be looked upon as kind of a, the family failure in a way. Um, but oddly enough, uh, uh, over the past 30 years, 40 years or so, uh, I've been able to create a kind of um, successful existence as a theater artist in, in North America. Um, someone who had a play produced in New York that got a rave review in the New York Times. Um, someone who has uh, been able to have a stable uh, um, 
uh, job in terms of running a uh, theater move for 20 years or so. Um, and so all of these things um, really uh, were a mystery to my family and were never really supported uh, until I, in some ways, had a, a, a kind of proven some aspect of, of uh, reliability and success to them. Um, the funny thing is, though, the one time that um, uh, I think I received a lot of uh, kudos from my family was for about a year and a half, I worked in a Canadian TV uh, uh, situation where I was one of the many staff writers at a Canadian television series for about a year and a half. And my joke was that I made more in that year and a half than I had in the previous 10 um, total. Um, I, I, I know a lot of Asian American artists whose parents didn't really support their choices. And I would say that I was lucky in that my mom, especially, was very, has always been very supportive of my artistic life. She herself, um, she herself loved to dance and loved Hollywood films and loved music. So she plays a little piano and she dances. And so when she saw from a very young age, from when I was a very young age that I loved to sing, she, you know, got me private singing lessons when I was seven and I did, I acted in musicals when I was in junior high. That was my first experience in theater. Um, and I was, I used to sing in the choir. I was raised Catholic, although I'm no longer Catholic, but I used to sing in the choir in our school choir because I went to parochial school. So I did a lot of singing when I was younger. And my mom has always been supportive of that. I would say the way that she doesn't understand me which can be a little bit frustrating is that, you know, she, she, she pushed me hard to be an artist, but the main importance was education and academics. So even though she wanted to me be, a, you know, she got me into private singing and piano lessons from a very young age. And so she would push that, but not at the cost of my academics. So I would have to be a straight A student and be good at arts. And and I think the, 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 the difficulty is it's hard to be good at everything, right? It's hard to be, um, it's hard to be, to put so much time in academics and put a lot of time into the art so that you do both successfully. And so it's a lot, it's a lot of pressure on a kid. So I think for a lot, a lot of my life, I felt like art was important, but I, I couldn't see having a career in the arts because my parents wanted me to have a more practical career, even though my mom would always say like, oh, you should practice your singing more. You should, you should do more shows. Like she sort of had like, I think, um, unrealistic ex expectations of how good I was going to be in either of those fields. So for a lot of my life, I really, you know, I was a journalist for a while before I became a professional actor. And I always did acting or and singing on the side, but um, I think the general expectation was that I would have a more practical career and do the acting and singing on the side, but I would still need to be good at those things. So there was this, like I said, there was just a lot of expectation around doing everything really well, which I think is difficult um, to do for anybody. So as an adult, I would say, you know, as, as, so I, I became a professional actor in 2002 and for many, many years I was doing, I was had a dual career as an actor, singer, director, theater maker. And my other career was as a writer producer, mostly in television. And um, for much of my career, the writing and producing was, was paying more of my bills than acting and, and theater. And, and then and, and but it, it, the the percentages kept shifting, and so um, as the years wore on, I was doing I was doing more work, I was making more money in in the arts. Until you know I and then it, and then that culminated in me being named the artistic director of Theater Moo and moving to the Twin Cities, and now I, I make all my money doing theater. That is my only career, 
and I and I, I and I wanted to leave writing and producing, and, and theater me was allowed me to do that. But I would say that my mother, she understands it, but she doesn't fully understand it. In that, when I when I had a dual career as a freelance writer producer and as a freelance artist, she didn't like she once like she never understood the work that I did. Like she would ask me questions like, "What do you do every day?" and "How." you know, how, how do you like live your life on a daily basis? And I would tell her, she's like, do you have a job? And I would say, well, I, I have projects. I'm a freelancer as a writer and as a, as an artist. So I have jobs and you know, they're not consistent. Like they, they come in consistently, but I'm not on the same job every day. And she didn't quite understand, but like, she said to me, like, I can never, she needs, she's the type of person that needs to have the same job to go to every day. Like she can't, she can't understand that, that, um, risk that live, living in that uncertainty. She, it's not something she can do well. So she once told me that she could never live that way and doesn't understand how, how someone lives their professional life in that way. And not to say that she wasn't supportive of it because she comes to all my shows. She's really proud of the work I do and, you know, she'll fly, she'll get on a plane and come see a show that I'm in. Like that's how much she's proud of the, the artistic work that I do. But I think on a very basic internal inherent level, it's hard for her to understand the artist's freelance life. And now that I have a full-time job leading a theater company, I think she's happy that my, my work is more stable, but we've also had conversations where she doesn't quite understand what I do every day and doesn't quite understand um, like for instance, she watched Mutini Hour the other week and she's watched a couple of Mutini Hours and which is the online hangout we have with theater artists and she loves them. Like she's really proud of the work and she's really impressed with it. But she's asked like, oh, so do you do that for Facebook? Like, is that a job you have with Facebook? Because it's on Facebook Live. She doesn't understand that that's what I do for the theater. So there, there's a disconnect with what she thinks my job is and what it really is, which, which is not, I mean, I think a lot of people have that disconnect. So I don't want to um, say that it's wrong, but I think in general, there's been this, um, she doesn't quite understand the artist's life and, um, and doing, and, and how, you know, having that life. Another example is when I, when I ran Ferocious Lotus in San Francisco, which is the, uh, the, the theater company that I founded in San Francisco, also an Asian American theater company. And that was a very small company and it was mostly made up of a, a, a collective of artists. And, you know, we weren't always getting paid for the work we were putting into the theater company. And, and so my mom was like, why do you do it? Like, why do you have the theater company if you're not getting paid enough to live? And I, I explained to her that it was really, um, uh, an act of love and that it was because it was my passion and I thought it was important to not only do the art, but be a social activist, improving representation on stage. And she could not understand, she still couldn't understand why I was doing it. That even though there was a larger impact it was making on the world and making the world a better place, that because it wasn't making me a salary that I could live on, she didn't understand why I was doing it. So I would say, um, with my mother in particular, I'm really grateful for her because I wouldn't be here today without her. Like, again, she got me singing lessons. She supported my work as an artist from a very young age. She, you know, allowed me to do shows when I was in school and has always supported my work, coming to my work and being really proud of the work that I do. That um, there's a little bit of a disconnect with, because I'm not doing the thing that is, stereotypically acceptable in an Asian family, which is to have a good salary job and do an, a regular nine to five job. Um, she, she still has a hard time wrapping her whole mind around it. All right. Well, I'm glad to know that you both have uh, successful arcs, um, regardless of the pressures your family and, and the disconnect that they have. Um, you both are still successful artists and we're glad to have you here doing the work that you do. And so we're moving on to our second guest question. What do you think the value of art is, whether you're describing your own discipline or other art forms during an ongoing crisis like the COVID-19 pandemic? Uh, let's say maybe a four minute tops summary. 
Um, let me just say quickly, um, I think the arts are at the heart of the human experience. Um, the arts can lift the human spirit, uh, challenge our intellect, and give us all an opportunity to express ourselves. It is more important than ever in these pandemic times, and we're discovering so many new ways to express uh, and share the arts. And so I think the arts are really important um, to us as we are here um, in our homes um, and having to share and reach out to each other. So um, I think that's important. Lily? I, I did a Rick Rick said it beautifully. <laughs> <laughs> I, I agree. I I think the arts are the are of the utmost importance, especially in times of crisis like we're in. You know, art is especially theater is. I mean, I would say art, especially theater, film, and television, because um, I think now in these times we're we're leaning into film and television more because we can watch it without being in the room with with people. Um, you know, it's it's storytelling and and the center of humanity and our connection with each other is through stories. When people ask about the importance of art, I just hold a mirror up to them and you see so many people through this shelter in place around the country, they're, you know, how are they spending their time? A lot of them are watching television. A lot of them are trying to find their new favorite TV show or they're watching films um, or they're, you know, they're learning something online with an artist teacher, like playing an instrument or singing or dancing. And, or, or, you know, a lot of people are cooking and baking and the culin doing the culinary arts. So I feel like when people question the importance of art, then I just say, well, what are you doing now? Because if you're watching television, or if you're watching films, if you're if you're reading a book, or um, you know following somebody's innovative recipe, that all of that is art. Like the people that you see on television or coming out of your screen, the people that you see in films coming out of your screen, um, the word on the page, all of it is art, and that's what's keeping people going through this time. Like imagine your life without art right now, without those things. And I think we, we would, in many ways, that's what's centering all of us and grounding us and, and giving us hope to move to the next day as we're, as we're isolated. I think without those things, like life would be very, very difficult right now, more difficult than it is. Agreed with both of you. Um, great questions. You heard it here, folks, from the, from the artists themselves. <laughs> Who else are you going to these answers from right so thank you both and so we have our last question which is actually two questions uh your choice they are the third question our neutral section which is tell about a time when you felt proud for learning or doing something difficult or in our positive question one of our positive questions tell a story of a time you accomplished something that felt great for number three about uh proud of learning something um that's difficult um for me uh one of the most difficult tasks is directing musicals because it involves not only acting, um, but also music and dance. And so you have these three elements that have all got to work together. And uh, I had no formal training or background in musical theater, but um, through a period of time from around 2004 through around 2014, um, I had the opportunity to direct a number of musicals, including Into the Woods and A Little Night Music by Sondheim, uh, the David Henry Wong version of um, the Flower Drum Song. Um, I did my own version of the Mikado. Uh, and all of these uh, musicals are really huge challenges. And I, I felt like I had this opportunity to learn how to do them and had quite a bit of success with those productions. Um, I do have to um, uh, give credit to uh, a couple of directors, uh, Gary Gisselman, and John Cranny, who directed some musicals for uh, Moo early on. Um, Gary directed Pacific Overtures and in 2002 or something like that. And then um, uh, John Cranny directed a couple of productions of The Walleye Kid, the musical. And so in a sense, I got to learn from them just as they, pro they, they directed those musicals. And then when I started my first uh, directing of a musical with um, a flower drum song in 2009, um, 
I was able to apply a lot of the things I had learned from that and had a wonderful time. And we had some tremendous successes with those musicals. So I was really um, uh, proud of, of that task of learning how to direct a musical. So in terms of, in terms of something that I accomplished that felt, I felt great, I think coming to the Twin Cities and being named the Artistic Director of Theatre Moo, which is an organization that I followed for most of my life, being that I'm an Asian American actor. And I'm so grateful to Rick, who's, who's in this conversation with me, for founding Theatre Moo and being a beacon for all of us Asian American theatre artists who didn't have very many beacons to follow. So I, I'm really grateful for being at Theater Moo and leading it right now. And it was a perfect symbol to me of how life, how thing, everything in life happens for a reason, because so many things lined up for me to be here in this position that wouldn't have been, and, and if like, if for example, the, the, the um, job had opened up a year earlier, I probably wouldn't have been qualified to, 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 um, be hired. And I, so the things that, that, that I would say the, the string of accomplishments that occurred that led me here was that, you know, I've been an actor most of my life. And, um, and then in 2015, I directed my first show was Chinglish, the Palo Alto players. And um, it, it was an award, award nominated show. And and, and I, it was a success, but I wasn't sure if I was going to continue directing. And then all of a sudden in 2018, I directed four shows in a row. And then, that, then in 2019, I was certified as a leadership coach. So I, I, I got all this, um, this knowledge and experience coaching and understanding leadership. And, um, and that same year... In 2019, my sister-in-law moved to Minneapolis randomly. She chose to move here on her own. And so um, it, it was kind of like kismet because everything lined up. So when, when in 2019, Theater Moo was looking for an artistic director, I had, when I came to interview, it was like the perfect timing for me to do this work. Like I had, I had established a national art, Actor and acting career. I had directed five shows. I had five shows under my belt, three of which, or four of which, were nominated for um, Theater Bay Area Awards. Um, one of which was on like five best of 2018 theater lists. And, um, and one of them had won one Theater Bay Area Award. And so I, I had this, I had a, a track record of directing um, award winning shows. And if, in, but before 2018, like that experience didn't exist. So that whole slew of shows that happened in a row was like great timing. And then I had experience, like I remember in my interview, they were asking me about my, you know, what I would do as a leader in certain situations. And I just got certified as a leadership coach. So I had all that experience and knowledge under my belt. And then finally, my sister-in-law had moved here. And so we had somebody here who could be our family like our family pillar here. And um, because my husband travels out for work, my, one of my fears coming here was that I wouldn't have, you know, my mother was helping a lot with my son, taking care of my son, but my sister-in-law, because she, she lived here, she was, she stepped forward and said, you know, if you need any help with Cole, like I can give that to you. So everything sort of lined up um, perfectly for me to take this position at Moo. And when I look back on that, like it's, it's, it's just uncanny. It's like very serendipitous. And I, and I feel like right before this position opened up, I was in a place that a lot of artists are in like, oh my God, I'll never work again. I'll never be cast again. Like I'm, I'm in a lull. I don't know what I'm, what I'm going to be doing um, with my life. And all of a sudden, like when they, they say, like when the universe closes the door, it opens a window, right? This, this position came up and that I was perfectly qualified for. And, um, at the perfect timing. And so, and so that, that, that life experience for me has, has um, been invaluable because when there's moments in my life where I feel like it's a failure or, um, or I'm not sure why, you know, I'm making it, I'm t uh, things are going on in my life that 
may not be exactly as planned. I remember that everything that has happened leading up to this point has happened for a reason. And that even the failures that have led me to this point, um, it's like, I feel like the universe had a plan for me and, and um, it's all led to doing this really impactful work at a theater company that's literally changing, trying to change the world and, and changing the world and supporting marginalized, you know, giving voice to marginalized stories and um, fighting racism and increasing representation of people of color on, st on America's stages. Like I, I would have never imagined that all the work that I did leading up to this point would, would, would culminate in this position, but, um, but slowly but surely every step on my journey as an artist and as a person has led me to this amazing opportunity. Um, and, and another, another, I know I'm talking along here, but, but another thing that happened that led me to this point is in 2000, and this is part of the difficult, you know, you asked about something difficult that I overcame and we had a very vocal, very national protest against uh, a theater company's production of the Mikado, which for those of you who don't know, is an old Gilbert, Gilbert, Gilbert and Sullivan operetta that um, basically makes jokes at the, at the expense of um, Asians and Asian Americans. And so that was a really lonely time initially, you know, because it's hard to be vocal about fight, you know, it's hard to be vocal and fight against racism. And we felt really alone as Asian American theater artists in doing that. But as we put our voice out there, then more and more people came forward and supported us nationally, both people of color as well as white allies. And we, we um, created far reaching change in that, in that, um, in that production. They, they took the production out of Japan, set in a different location, changed the name to the new Mikado. And now other, other, and it, it was not, no longer offensive to Asian, Asians and Asian Americans. And now other people around the world are doing that production. So um, that, that work I think also led me to this place where I had the confidence to have a voice and fight against racism when I see it, especially in, art, in the arts field. Yes, the the amount of growth that you both have have had in your in your life is very apparent, and we're so glad to have captured that today for the listeners uh, to see the value of Asians doing doing art and doing art well for many. So that's it for our main rec main recording. Uh, for to hear more from Lily and Rick, we are going to enter our extended Patreon Stitch Picks recording, where you'll get to hear them answer a few of our other questions in our Stitch Pick. <sighs> story stitch game but for now uh we're gonna say bye and we'll see you on the next episode which will be featuring kaden and samala from 18 the organization 18 million rising so watch out for that uh thanks so much lily and rick thank you thank you all right thanks for having us the questions that guide this episode were drawn from green card voices virtual story stitch activity virtual story stitch is a modified version of gcv's story stitch conversation card game Story Stitch was co-created with 70 community members as a way to build deep connections between immigrants and their neighbors by telling stories, opening minds, and encouraging people to get to know one another. In March of 2020, responding to the COVID-19, also named the coronavirus pandemic, we co-created it again and came up with a virtual version of the game to stay connected, share our stories, and feel less isolated during the time of social distancing. In addition to the 33 questions in Green Card Voices Story Stitch deck, we have added seven bonus questions pertaining to the COVID-19 pandemic. For more information, visit patreon.com spelled P-A-T-R-E-O-N slash virtual story stitch. If you're ready to have access to your own virtual story stitch kit, join by becoming a patron on our Patreon today and give what you can. Your support funds the free services and resources we offer to our community. Thank you.